Hi! I don't discuss this much in the context of this channel, but I'll admit now that I'm currently involved in a university degree study with a major focus in psychology and a minor focus in sociology. As such, I've been around the block quite a bit with academic practices of all kinds. One such practice I've had to endure time and time again is an academic analysis of some form of media, usually a popular film or a fictional work of writing. If you're unfamiliar, this practice requires the student to apply the topic of study and its components to a piece of media and place them in context with the composition of said piece of media. You take things like the characters, the way they interact, the motifs of the writing and score and direction, and place them within the framework that that field of study utilizes in real-world applications. My most recent example of this type of assignment required me to take the film Fight Club and define the events of the movie in the context of a sociological principle referred to as deviance, which was actually really enjoyable. Something that I've noticed about these assignments, though, regardless of what field of study they appear within, is the omission of a particularly prominent form of content from the pool of available choices, video games. It seems to me, to some considerable extent, that academia has yet to consider this form of storycraft to be valid for analysis inside the classroom. Whether this is because of traditional stigmas like video games being perceived as meant for children or a generational gap that creates a roster of professors and teachers who aren't aware of the medium of video games and their growing complexity and maturity in general is a topic for another day. In any case, whatever the cause, the lack of recognition of video games in academic context is an oversight one that I seek to discuss in part today. This video will replicate one of the aforementioned media analysis assignments and use video games to explain the sociological definition and study of deviance and deviant behavior. Furthermore, this video essay will make commentary on the effectiveness of video games as a form of media for academic analysis in addition to explaining why allowing interactive visual media as opposed to non-interactive visual media should be a prominent point of discussion amongst leaders in the field of post-secondary education. Ladies, gents, germs, worms, this is deviancy in interactive media, or how I learned to stop worrying and love breaking the social norms. To begin, we need to define what the concept of deviance is, the manner with which the field of sociology discusses it, and the typologies we witness deviance in. Deviance, as is stated in the sociology textbook Constructions of Deviance by Adler and Adler, is defined in these terms. When we speak of deviance, we refer to the violations of social norms. This is to say that deviance is the failure to meet social expectations for commonly accepted public conventions, like returning the offer for a handshake with a low five, for example. Try that at your next job interview, I dare you. What's important to note here is that since deviance is based on social norms, these expectations are subject to very dynamic shifts that occur over time and when moving from one society to another, or even from one subgroup to another within a single society. This socially constructed nature of deviance means that behaviors or ideas that are exclusionary in one group may be accepted or even encouraged in a different group. Because these boundaries can shift dramatically depending on the context in which they are formed, sociology has to utilize a definition that can inherently account for those unexpected differences. The open nature of this definition of deviance is the main distinction that sets sociology apart from other fields like criminology or psychology. While other fields of study may apply definitions to the idea of deviance that uphold some form of objective measure of a good-bad paradigm, such as a mental illness diagnosis being seen as inherently negative in the medical community, or the breach of a law resulting in the legal system labeling someone as a criminal, regardless of the situational factors like, say, self-defense, sociology does no such thing. Instead, sociology makes the distinction that because different groups and cultures see different things as positive and negative, there is no universal moral appraisal for behavior, and as such the word deviance carries no moral connotation. This means that, despite the general understanding of the word to be a negative thing, deviance and deviant behavior are not inherently negative or positive, merely perceived as such in the social context in which they occur. Essentially, think of this normative expectation, the social norm of society, as the x-axis of a bar graph. Conforming to those standards, greater than expectation will place you above that axis, while defying those norms places you underneath it, and, depending on the context, both of these things can be appraised as positive or negative. We'll discuss this function of deviance in greater detail as we break down the typology of deviance, but for now, keep these bullet points in mind. Deviance is defined as behaviors, ideas, and beliefs that are not in line with socially constructed normative expectations. Because deviance is socially constructed, the same behavior can be appraised differently by two different groups, or the same way for different reasons. There is no inherent moral connotation to the word deviance or deviant behavior. Both deviant and excessive normative behaviors can be appraised positively or negatively based on contextually informed reviewing. So we now have a basic outline for what deviance is and how sociology applies that concept to its examinations of human interaction and societal appraisals. Now we'll expand upon that idea and discuss the four prominent types of deviance. Each of these four types rests as part of a sort of matrix, set at the cross points between their defiance or overconformity with social expectations and whether they are perceived socially as positive or negative. 
The four types are as follows. Negative deviance, positive deviance, deviance admiration, and rate busting. First we have negative deviance. Negative deviance is the generally understood definition of deviance in colloquial terms. It's where the belief, idea, or behavior violates a norm and receives a negative evaluation. This type of deviance is most in line with the public perception of things like crime or drug addiction, where these behaviors are looked negatively upon by the public and may result in a deviant label that separates those deviant actors from the general public. Second is positive deviance. Positive deviance is a more uncommon commonly discussed form of deviance in the public, likely because it receives a positive evaluation and doesn't breach public expectations. This is where a behavior, belief, or idea overconforms with the normative expectation and receives, as stated, a positive evaluation. This form of deviance would relate directly to the teacher's pet archetype, someone who goes above and beyond what is expected of a person in that social context to fall in line with what society expects, like the classic idea of bringing a teacher an apple every day. Third is deviance admiration. Deviance admiration is most directly connected with elements of social life like activism. This is where a behavior, belief, or idea defies a social norm but is met with a positive evaluation. A good example of this would be the civil rights movement and its protests in the 1960s, which sought to shift the treatment of people of color using means that defied the preset social definitions for minorities affected by Jim Crow era racism. Finally, there's rate busting. Rate busting is where a norm is overconformed with and receives a negative appraisal. The best example I can give of this typology is in factory work, where one individual greatly exceeds expected production, leading to the factory manager criticizing the now seemingly poor performance of the other workers by comparison. Those remaining workers would see that behavior as negative, as a direct result of their overreaching the expectation. What these four types of deviance reinforce is the concept that deviance is not just failing to meet or actively defying social norms, but also exceeding them in an additive manner, which is something that we fail to recognize outside of academic practice and normal social interaction, or at least recognize less than negative forms of deviance. It's important to note that there are other means to analyze deviance as well, such as within Robert Burden's functional typology of deviance. This form of analysis won't be discussed in detail here, largely because it would exceed the limit of understanding that a crash course like this seeks to establish. I mention it briefly anyway because it shows that different internal perspectives within the field of sociology will apply these types of deviance in different ways, and can occasionally expand upon them to diversify the subject as necessary to study the world around us. I recommend purchasing a copy of Constructions of Deviance by Adler and Adler if you'd like to dive further into these applied studies of deviance. For now though, we'll remain within the theoretical sphere and work solely with these types of deviance that we've been discussing thus far. As a short recap, let's compress the descriptions we'll be moving forward with. There are four types of deviance, negative, positive, deviance admiration, and rate busting. These four types of deviance function on a spectrum that goes above and below the accepted socially normative construction of behavior. It is equally possible for behaviors that fall above and below the normative expectation to be evaluated positively and negatively. There are additional applications for the concept of deviance that won't be discussed here, but you may see in other areas of study within the field of sociology. Thus far, we've defined deviance, discussed how sociology examines and applies that term, and divided the idea of deviance into its four types, as well as noted the additional typologies of deviance that appear in other sociological perspectives. Now, we need to bring in our example of interactive media, and more specifically video games. To begin, I want to break down why this is something distinguishable from examining non-interactive media with the same sociological lens. The distinguishing factor here is how we interact with these opposing forms of media, and the separation from our intended detail of study created by the limitations of non-interactive forms of media. Non-interactive media, like movies or literature, is entirely fixed. That is to say, nothing about what we see in those pieces of media can be changed or influenced in a way that tests the boundaries set by the socially constructed norms of that fictional world outside of what is already being shown to us. This limitation of the medium means that our understanding of what can be or is deviant in the context of that work is limited to more mundane and superficial examples, even if these examples display the characteristics of deviance that we wish to understand. Interactive media, on the other hand, allows for some viewer control, even in instances where we experience a linear story with definite ends. The interactive nature of video games allows for us to create our own events and interactions with the characters in that piece of media and better understand, and more importantly emulate, real-world instances of deviant behavior in a safe yet parallel context to real life. In short, because we can create and experience larger varieties of deviant behavior and create new instances of deviance within the boundaries of that piece of media, we are better able to experiment and understand the media we are analyzing in the context of deviance when we engage with interactive media versus, say, non-interactive media. Take for example, watching a film like Heat versus playing a game like Payday the Heist. Heat is a movie about the undertakings of a crew of criminals who rob a bank and the efforts of NYU cops to stop them in this endeavor. In this instance, we can witness the bank robbery and see how the characters react to and appraise it in terms of deviant behavior, but our separation from interacting with the setting and characters means that we can only ever witness it one way.
way. That way being from the perspective of the characters and the way the story is told. There's nothing changing about that. Haiti the Heist, similar to Heat, is also about robbing banks and committing similar crimes, yet allows the viewer to engage in the behavior itself and witness the same type of event from a more involved, informed perspective. Essentially, our capability to be safely involved with deviants allows us to skirt the real-world ethical issues and physical limitations that would arise from testing these behaviors in our actual lives, while expanding upon the fictional expanses of the media we examine to a more comprehensive extent. To recap, let's take these points with us as we apply specific examples to the typologies of deviants. Because we interact differently with interactive and non-interactive media, our capability to analyze the concept of deviance within these pieces of media is inherently different. The fixed nature of non-interactive media limits our comprehension of deviant behavior and events to what we are shown. The interactive nature of media, like video games, allows us to create and experiment with examples of deviance outside of what is laid out for us, giving us a heightened understanding of deviant behavior. The capability to interact with media allows us to study deviance in a safe, often analogous environment that gives us some insight to real-life functionality, even in fictional settings. Now that we've discussed the added value that interactive media has over non-interactive media, let's apply examples from various sources of interactive media to the concepts we've discussed thus far. To begin, I want to look at an example of how we can see the socially constructed nature of deviance and how the appraisal of beliefs, behaviors, and ideas will change between groups. Red Dead Redemption 2 has to be one of the best games of the past decade, with a complex story and an array of characters who collectively establish the primary interactions throughout the game's duration. The game, as many of you probably already know, follows the story of Arthur Morgan and the gang of outlaws he runs with at the turn of the 20th century. Largely, the game deals with the gang's struggle for survival in a rapidly modernizing Western America that has labeled them as outcasts as a result of their deviant reliance on crime as a means to continue existing, a theme that's reinforced constantly throughout the game. Being placed directly into a deviant subgroup of the larger society of the American West immediately places you in a position to duly analyze both the perspective of the quote-unquote innocent people around them and the internal workings of their deviant group. We see characters like the gang's leader Dutch Vanderbilt attempt to justify their actions and motivations for deviant behavior as a means to put their persecution to an end, or nullify the idea that the gang is at all, quote, the bad guy. Simultaneously, the outward appraisal of the gang received from the public around them allows us to witness how their behavior has come to be labeled as deviant in a setting that sees the death of the old Wild West. Furthermore, our placement as a character in this gang allows us to personally commit acts of deviance and attempt to justify and neutralize the deviant label our character and their subgroup face as a result of the deviant act of crime being defined up in the context of the game world, something that is directly analogous to the death of the cowboy in the real world world American 1900s. Now, defining deviance up is a concept we haven't discussed yet, but it is in essence a society deciding that behavior, like gunslinging or train robbing for example, is now deviant based on a shift in societal norms when it was previously more acceptable. Defining deviance down is also a thing, but it doesn't really apply in this context. It's essentially where the society says something that was deviant is now less or no longer deviant, something like, uh, say, tattoos, which have come back in grand prominence as a public form of art uh, over the past two decades or so. So not only has this game introduced us to a setting and a cast of characters that allows us to distinguish the broader societal norms in play alongside a subgroup set of norms that reinforce different behaviors, but also involves us in those deviant acts that result in the labeling of the group as undesirable and forces us to reconcile and experience this in a way that would not be possible with a fixed piece of media, all the while maintaining an analogous historical perspective on deviant behavior. While this title works perfectly to engage our definition of deviance and informs our analysis of the media well, we can go deeper than that, and we will do so by breaking down each type of deviance in the same manner. We now have a broad example of how video games with the right construction can be at minimum as effective as fixed media in the academic analysis of the concept of deviance. To reinforce this idea, I want to break down each type of deviance briefly with examples from other titles as a means of expanding upon the broad applicable nature of interactive media as a valid academic focus area. Let's start with negative deviance, as it's almost certainly the most common form of typology present in video games. As a refresher, this is where a behavior, idea, or belief both violates the social norm in place and receives a negative evaluation for doing so. The most obvious examples of this are deviant acts like crime that are emulated in video games. Take for example random acts of violence or robberies in a game like Mafia 2. These behaviors in the context of the rules of this game's virtual New York City, much like our own, view these behaviors as je ne sais quoi bad. As such, the story of the game sees our main character, essentially the player themselves, being thrust into a life of crime that steadily places them into the hot seat of law enforcement and criminal investigations, i.e. the violation of norms is evaluated as negative and dealt with as such. Next up is positive deviance, which is where a behavior, idea, or belief exceeds the normative expectation and receives positive evaluation. Truth be told, this is a difficult form of deviance to analyze for me, largely because it identifies as an extreme form of the normative behavior and is not colloquially known as a form of deviant behavior in the real world. 
world. As such, I am a bit more strapped for examples of this. But I'm not completely lost. There's a game called Cooking Mama, which was released for the Nintendo Wii and DS back in the mid 2000s. This game emulated the practice of cooking various meals of differing difficulties and encouraged the player to match the examples given as a means to create the quote unquote perfect dish, which could be taken as the norm for this context. As such, the reinforcement of behaviors that emulate and expand upon that norm to a point where the player is constantly striving and working for a perfect score would represent positive deviance, as those efforts, when executed properly, would be appraised positively. Third up, we have deviance admiration, which is where a behavior, idea, or belief violates the social norm and receives a positive evaluation. In the context of interactive media, I immediately thought of a game called The Darkness 2, which puts you in the shoes of a mob boss named Jackie Estacado who has the extraordinary power of literally controlling the forces of darkness. The story is about Jackie facing off with a rival gang that seeks to steal his power from him and use it for their own nefarious purposes. As such, a good amount of gang warfare happens, and the game utilizes that in the interactive sense by creating a point system that rewards you points for every kill you receive. Should you use the powers of the darkness to kill enemies in particularly and exceedingly gruesome ways, you receive more points. Essentially, the more deviant from the social norm you make the killing, the more points, and therefore admiration, you receive from the game itself. The function of deviance admiration is the very thing that makes the gameplay loop work in the first place. Reward deviance on a scale equivalent to the deviant nature of the act. Finally, we have rate busting, which is a form of deviance where a behavior, idea, or belief exceeds the norm and receives a negative evaluation. A good example example of this comes from Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Pain, where the goal of the game is essentially to complete a series of stealth-based missions without being spotted by guards or killed in the process. As the game goes on, it tracks your progress through a rating system, and then utilizes that rating system to adjust your encounters in the game to raise the difficulty. For example, if you're a really accurate shooter and consistently land headshots on your targets, the game will take that information and punish you by adding enemies that wear bulletproof helmets. Your performance was so good that the game evaluated it as negative and adjusted accordingly. All told, the gameplay loops here, much like with Deviant's admiration, function directly on the basis of analyzing the behavior as Deviant. Today, we've defined and examined deviance as a concept in the field of theoretical sociological studies and used those concepts to legitimize and analyze items of interactive media. We covered the typology of deviant behaviors, discussed how things become deviant, and the socially constructed parameters of the concept itself. Hopefully, you found all this to be educational and interesting, and it drives you to read more on the subject of sociology of deviance, or at least general sociology. This whole operation would have been impossible without the wonderful work of Adler and Adler in their textbook, Constructions of Deviance. Go out and buy a copy if this is a topic of interest for you. Additional thanks have to be given to my sociology professor Jesse Smith, whose lectures helped me describe the elements of the collegiate level course in plain English. Thank you for being an incalculable asset to this project and a delightfully entertaining professor. I'm really sorry we're all too exhausted to do call and response when we're in lecture. <laughs> Everyone else watching, thank you for making it this far or even clicking on the video at all. It means the world to me to hold your attention this way and give you something to think about. Click the like and subscribe buttons below if you're interested in more video essays like this. Um, cue the obligatory screenshot of the videos I'm currently working on on the screen now. There's more in there that I just haven't gotten around to adding in yet, so just keep an eye out for the next one coming most likely by the end of this month. Here's a hint for you on what the next video is going to be. Rot flesh. That's all you get. Thanks again for watching, I love all of you guys, and I hope you all have a dreadful day.